Uh, joining us to answer that question as well, from Altitude TV, Lauren Jabara, and from NBC Sports Philly, Taryn Hatcher. Welcome, ladies. Hey, guys. Hi, guys. Oh, <laughs> Jake's <laughs> Lauren. <laughs> we'll start with you, Lauren. Uh, would you rather be in the Western bubble or the Eastern bubble? I think I'd rather be in the Western bubble. One, obviously, the avalanche is there. And sure. two, um, I just feel like Edmonton is so much more spread out, right? So there's a lot more space outdoors to put like a basketball court and areas to eat in and i'm a big outdoorsy person so i think just in general i'd rather be in the western bubble and on top of that they're having the conference finals and the stanley cup finals there so it'd be nice to just like be in one location but i do love toronto as a city you just wouldn't be able to explore as much as you normally would you know when you go there on a normal road trip the conference finals and, and cup final was something i had not <laughs> i had not thought about that but that's an excellent point taryn how about you I don't know, because Lauren made great points, <laughs> but I think honestly, because you're you're kind of stuck. Like Brian Elliott brought it up, his whole family's in Toronto, but he can't really see them. I think it's got to be based off of like who I would be in the bubble with. And I love Lauren, and I love Carlin, so I'm kind of like maybe I would go to the West, <laughs> but maybe I would bring Flyers pre and post game reporter Katie, Katie Emmer. Her and I could like road trip across the country to Edmonton, but I love Toronto, so I'm kind of like I would love to be in the city of Toronto, but you can't. You can't really leave. So maybe Katie and I would road trip across the country to see you guys over out in the West, unless Carlin comes to the Eastern bubble. So she's close to the Western side of Canada, of course. <laughs> they can't get my directions right anyway. So who knows where I'll be? I'll probably be in the middle of Canada. <laughs> yes. You'll be in the Winnipeg we'll meet bubble. Carlin in Winnipeg, yeah. yeah. Oh my God, no. <laughs> she's like, I made it. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right, let's start with Lauren. Um, Colorado, obviously not part of the qualifying rounds, but they'll have round robin games. But now that you've got one, uh, I, I don't really like calling them exhibition games, um, but now you've got one exhibition bubble game under your belt. Uh, what is the biggest challenge in reporting on a game like this as compared to, uh, to normal? I think there's a couple challenges. One for me was just keeping the energy alive. So I'm actually broadcasting at Pepsi Center and kind of roaming around the arena, but our play-by-play -play and analyst and studio and studio host and studio analyst are all the way down like 30 minutes south of Denver in our altitude studios. So I kind of felt isolated at Pepsi Center and there was no lights, no ice. It was super dark. So that was definitely a challenge, just kind of keeping the energy alive. And I think on top of that, um, and Tara and Carlin, you guys know this too, like the biggest part of our job is to be a vessel of knowledge between the players and the fans and come up with those storylines that maybe aren't necessarily 100% hockey focused all the time. And a lot of the time we get those stories by just going into the locker room after practice and sitting down at stalls and just having conversations with these guys. And I feel like we just don't have that access right now to necessarily have those personal relationships and get some of those you know, fun stories that we necessarily would um, because all of the interviews are over a Zoom with like 10 other reporters or 12 other reporters. So sometimes it's tough to get questions. And I think those for me might be the biggest two differences. Taryn, what did you think? Yeah, I would say that that second point you touched on is especially hard for me because we've been very fortunate this year with the Flyers locker room. It's a great group of guys. They all get along really well. And so you kind of actually... You'll go talk to like Scott Lawton about something and Michael Roffel will pop into your conversation and sort of dog him out about something else. And then you get a different story that you didn't even know was going to come up. Right. And that's the fun stuff because it's not already written in the newspaper. You can't already find that story on Twitter. It's completely new and it's a really organic story. It's not like you're prodding questions in order to get a target story. It's a very natural thing which kind of, I think, captures a lot of the personalities of these players. So it's hard because you're kind of deprived of that interaction and getting to do that. Um, but other than that, like, we're very fortunate. Lauren and I were actually texting about this the other day. We're very fortunate that our studio is in Wells Fargo Center. And actually myself, Jim Jackson, who does our play-by-play, -play, and Keith Jones, who's currently doing um, analysis for our games, we're all in the rafters at Wells Fargo Center together. Obviously, it's empty and it's very quiet, um, but I can actually hear them from very far away, though. I can oh, wow. hear JJ whenever somebody's like, w whenever somebody's about to score, JJ raises his voice or oh, takes yeah. a shot, you know, obviously. <laughs> and so you still get that excitement, which I value more than I can even put into words because it it makes the game. I grew up listening to Jim Jackson also, so like that voice means a lot to me. Um, 
But yeah, it is so bizarre. You know, our second intermission, I have to wrap around an interview. That's one question that's done by somebody else in Toronto. And a lot of times it's like not the question that I would ask if I was there. Yeah. So you're trying to frame it from someone else's perspective, which is interesting. But you know what? Worst things have happened to better people and we're talking about a sport and it's still a ton of fun. So I'll take it for what it is and just be happy that hockey's back. How, and then does, how does the prep work change too? Because you're, we're talking about the stories that we aren't getting anymore, right? Those stories that we're not getting inside of the locker room, those organic things that just pop up. I mean, sometimes, you know, we'll get the message from PR like, oh, a player's family's watching them for the first time tonight. So then there's those stories in the crowd that you can go get as well. So without all of the stuff that you ladies are talking about, how does your prep work change? And maybe what is like a production meeting look like now? And, and what do you have to over prepare for to make up for some of the lack of this stuff? Uh, I just know for me, and it's kind of been a thing that I've actually found in my second year with the Flyers has worked out much better for me is, is tracking things over time. Like what guys have said throughout the weeks and how it changes and evolves or how it stays the same, the stuff that keeps popping up, because then you know that that's actually something that's meaningful and true. And it's not kind of like a canned PR response that they're throwing out to you. Sure. Um, especially when it does change. That's the interesting thing. Like we talk about Nick Obey Cubell on our team a lot, who was a guy who was on the Phantoms for a long time, got pulled yep. up and had a stellar season. Yep. And the commentary on him changed a lot throughout the season. So for me, it's like, I look back in my notes from January versus my notes from March versus what they're saying now in training yeah, camp. I and that too, I bet. Story. <laughs> oh, I have, I just, I have my boyfriend thinks I'm a hoarder. I have like three of these notebooks. They look exactly the same. They're completely yep. like, it's so hard to read any of them. Cause I'm like scribbling during games and stuff. But yep. you, when you can't get like a unique kind of story in a vacuum from that day or that week or whatever, sometimes you kind of have to come up with them from stuff you've noticed over time. Um, and that's when I think like holding on to a quote from three months ago sounds crazy, but it ends up actually paying off huge right now. So that's yeah. how I'm tackling it. Yeah. And I throw in text me stories and then I use them in the broadcast. <laughs> hey, I'm here for you ladies. <laughs> Anything you need, I got. <laughs> I know. I think honestly, Terry, and I feel the same way as well. Like I look at someone that the abs brought to the bubble, Con Connor Timmons. He's one of our defensemen and he was, he was going to make the abs team and then ended up having two big concussions was out of hockey for a year and a half and then came back, had a decent training camp this year. Um, and then played for the Colorado Eagles, our AHL team. And then he came back for this 10, 11, 12 day summer training camp. And he was phenomenal. And you even see like what head coach Jared Bednar says back in the fall during that training camp. And they're like, yeah, he has a lot of potential. He still needs a little bit of work though, but he's getting there. And then seeing what he, what he said about him, you know, after this camp and he's like, wow, he's really been, he's going to be an impact player for our team for years to come or bring him to the bubble because of that. And, and even just watching him play and, and watching you know, the differences between September and July. It's just crazy to see the growth of these guys. So it's cool to have storylines like that in general. And I think for me too, um, coming up with storylines now, this bubble is something we've never seen before, right? So I've been kind of trying to find different ways of talking about what the guys are doing inside the bubble or how they keep the ice, you know, good. They're playing three games a day in each arena. It's difficult to keep that ice the same from game one all the way to game three so doing storylines like that too that some people might not have necessarily all of the knowledge on and we can ask questions about it and we can do research on it um that kind of thing too i think that that's also really interesting and in terms of prep all of our meetings are through zoom i feel like after this if i never have to see a zoom again in my life <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm just like, I want to just hug people. I'm just like, I miss people. I was like, yeah. Moses and Pete are play by play and analysts. I'm like, I miss you guys. Like, I just want to give you guys a big hug. You know, it's just, I know. I feel like I miss that social interaction with people. And even my photographer that's down at Pepsi Center, he has to stand six to eight feet away. And I'm just like, hey, what's up? You know, <laughs> so I, I miss that. But in terms of prep, yeah, everything through Zoom and then just finding different story ideas like that. The other half of uh, of being in the locker room and getting to see people face to face is is being around your colleagues, right? And one of the things I'm always 
probably to a fault that I'm hyper aware of is not stepping on other people's work, right? If I see somebody having a, a private one-on-one -on -one with one of the players, I'll listen, but I don't want to, you know, crib audio from them or, or take their story. How, how difficult is it? We'll start with you, Taryn. How difficult is it to coordinate work that you're doing with maybe something that, you know, the CBC is working on or TSN or, or a beat writer or, when we are all far apart from each other and doing this all on Zoom, how difficult is it to coordinate this multi-team effort? I think, honestly, at this point, there's just a lot of kind of like understanding amongst people because it's limited for everybody, right? Like when we get on these calls, sometimes they go on for, you know, three minutes, five minutes, whatever. And depending on how long a guy talks, you can only get so many questions in. And then a lot of people are only pulling from four answers. Um, but again, that's one of those things where I look at, like we were very fortunate during the pause that we got a lot of interviews with Flyers players and we got to ask them very unique things. And I get it was a while ago, but in reality, a lot of them haven't done much since other than gone to training camp and gone up to the bubble. So for me, it's like, maybe let's revisit these unique things that some of those interviews were 20 minutes. We cut three minutes of it and put it on our website. And who knows how many people saw it then? Well, let's revisit those other 17 minutes and see how what that what they said then applies to what's going on now. Like a lot of people are talking about conditioning and shockingly in the Flyers Penguins game the other night, there wasn't a lot of guys, you know, keeled over hands on knees <laughs> by the end of a long shift. Like people were fairly well conditioned. Yeah. Well, we were talking about Sean Couturier ran and did yoga the entire pause until phase two because he couldn't get back to Canada. So it's interesting. We, you can build stories off of those unique moments that you had a while ago. Um, but other than that, yeah, there is some redundancy, I think, between, you know, however many reporters are on the call, because not all of them even get their questions in. Like, there's times where, right. and I'm fortunate, but I'll have, like, my hand raised thing, but I raised it on the second to last question, and so they don't get to, to my raise because it was a follow-up to something somebody else said. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it's such a limited vacuum right now. It is hard, but that's again, where I go back to, all right, when did I talk to this guy where I got something nobody else got? It might've been in March, truthfully, but no one's heard it. It's still new to them. So yeah. let's see how we can take that, bring it into the present and make it a completely different story. Um, but then you have things like Sean Gaturier's daughter was born three days before he left. Everybody's going to cover oh, that wow. story. It's oh, just yeah. about bringing something new to it. And yeah, just trying your best. Honestly, it's a unique, it's a unique time for everybody. <laughs> There's a lot going on in my background right now. My room yeah. is the fridge and her dog is like right here sitting there. <laughs> I was like, I was like trying to focus for a second. I'm like, she's opening the fridge. Her dog's like running by. I'm like, what is happening? <laughs> what did we need? Yeah, what we have a need? very, uh, a very strict pro dog, uh, Cam oh, yeah. cameo policy here on all the games. I know he's really cute too. His name's Channing. Bring the dog, Bring the dog in. <laughs> There's Channing. He's Hi, cute Channing. Too. <laughs> oh, oh he's getting God. shy. A <laughs> <laughs> white fluff. <laughs> Jesse, he oh. kind of looks like my Wally, doesn't he? He does a little bit, yeah. Although it looked like he had a dark spot on one of his hips. Like I, he just darted. Oh no, he's just wearing a diaper because he's old. Oh. And <laughs> 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 Every time Laura and I do anything together, it becomes like so far left of what is supposed to go on. <laughs> How's the bubble? Oh my gosh. Well, dog's wearing a diaper and uh, that's a totally know. different kind of bubble. Um, <laughs> okay, I need to rein it in. What was even what was the question? Yeah, <laughs> so uh, to, to reset, Lauren, just curious how you deal with the challenges of. Um, as Taryn said, maybe a, some redundant reporting as everybody's rushing to get the same stories out to their audience. Yeah, I agree with Taryn too. I think she said it's like understood just between all the members of the media. And we all know that you can use each other's questions. You can use each other's answers. Um, but that's happened to me a few times too, where you do the hand raising feature. And I'm like, it's such a good question. I really want to ask it because I can possibly like form a storyline around it and they don't get to it. And so that part's kind of frustrating and challenging. Um, but at the same time too, we also had a show all through quarantine altitude sports. Did. It was a two hour sports show every single weekday. And so we did a lot wow. of interviews with a lot of different avalanche players um, throughout that whole time. So I've kind of been going back to that stuff and, 
and finding storylines through that too. Like someone like Ryan Graves, he's from Nova Scotia. He was quarantining at Prince Edward Island, which I've never been. I heard it's beautiful. Um, but he drove all the way from PEI to Denver by himself. It's like 45 hours just because he didn't want to quarantine when he got back. Cause if you fly, you know, the guys had to quarantine for 14 days. Yeah. Um, so he made that drive by himself 45 hours. And we were just asking him, you know, what he's, what he was doing during the drive. That was the third time that he's done it. He actually did it before preseason this year too, as well. Um, so it's just really fun to find those kind of storylines. But yeah, in terms of, you know, people stepping on each other's toes, I think it's all just understood that, you know, everyone needs to get at least one question in. You can use each other's answers for storylines and, you know, no one can get upset if you feel like you're stealing someone else's content because it's, it's, we just have to make the best of what we have right now. And, and it's all, you know, universal, everything that we're doing is being put out for everybody. And every question that everyone's asking is being put out for everyone. So just kind of having that understanding and, and being able to use other people's sound without getting, you know, mad at it or mad that someone else is taking your storyline or some, anything along those lines. Well, in two hours a day, um, it sounds like you guys have a lot to talk about. I guess that comes hand in hand yeah. with um, following a team that's a contender for the cup. We don't have that problem uh, here at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get yeah. real quick into uh, <laughs> into predictions before we let you go. Lauren, the Colorado Avalanche, obviously not participating in a qualifying round. They're playing their round robin games. Before the season started, I picked them to win the cup. I mean, how good do they look? How do you gauge their chances in this bubble scenario? Yeah, honestly, the Avs have a good problem. One, just talking about the guys that are playing between the pipes. We don't even know who's going to be starting come round one on August 11th because Pavel Francouz has 21 wins on the season and Philip Grubauer has 18. Both of them have been phenomenal and Grubauer has dealt with injuries all season long. So just starting from the back, working forward, um, the goaltender situation, it's a good problem to have not knowing who you're going to start because they're both so good. And um, defensively, you look at someone like Ryan Graves, who no one knew who that was at the beginning of the season, and he's worked himself up to be in the top defensive pairing next to Kale McCarr, who everyone knows Kale McCarr is just phenomenal at what he does. And then you look up up top with all the forwards, lines one through four, and the depth that the Avs have, they almost don't even know which forwards are going to be sitting out because there's so much talent and so much potential in this team that – Jared Bednar is still just like, I don't know, you know, who exactly is going to be in that starting lineup come Sunday against the Blues. We were kind of trying to figure it out, but there's going to be like one or two forwards that are left out that on any other team could potentially be a top, like a top six, even top nine um, forward. So just looking at the depth on this Avalanche team, they have a lot of potential to be able to win this season. They just need to tighten it up a little bit. Um, get a little more discipline. There was, I think, at the beginning of the third period, the first nine minutes, they killed off like six minutes, like six penalty minutes in the first nine minutes of the third period. So just, in, I think that might just be shaking off some rust. You know, you're not on the ice. You're finally playing against someone that's not your own team for the first, in, you know, in just four and a half months. I feel like these guys got so tired of scrimmaging each other, Taryn. I don't know if the Flyers felt the same way, but just watching them towards the end, you're like, okay, you could just tell that these guys are ready to go. Oh, yeah. Scott Lawton was mic'd up for a practice one day, and he was like, man, I just want to hit somebody. And he, But you can't, because it's scrimmage. And, like, you know, if, and he's all hyped up because they're just – I think so many of them felt like they were pent up for so long. But, yeah, you could tell they were just – especially because the Flyers' first exhibition game was against the Penguins. So, you know, they're all buddies. Uh, no, they were just ready to ramp it up and hit somebody, especially a Penguins player, hard. And it was – for me, it was just hearing – you know, the sound of a puck on ice and a stick hitting a puck. It was just like Christmas morning to me. So, yeah, no, I think the guys are ready to hit somebody. And then as, as far as the Flyers go, not to be incredibly redundant with what Lauren said, but <laughs> the Flyers have had, you know, first round yips historically recently. Um, but they've also gotten themselves in a great goaltending situation, which they haven't exactly had for, you know, quite a while here. Uh, so in a great place in terms of that. And then you have a Selkie trophy finalist in Sean Couturier and a Jack Adams finalist in Elaine Vino for head coach. And you're just sitting there like, and I think with Philly fans and we saw when the Eagles won the Super Bowl, you believe in your team, you really believe in your team, but you also kind of, you brace yourself for the impact of heartbreak and people kind of now are looking around like, 
so this team could do this, huh? Because like we've got issues defensively in that Shane Goss bear, who two years ago was a top blue liner is now potentially going to be a healthy scratch. They've just got so many great young defensemen. And then you can mix and match these lines in terms of the forwards and they're able to produce. And then you look at Elaine Vino. We talked to him in March and he was preparing like day by day, preparing for the return. He's one of, when I talked to like Ian LaPerriere or Mike Yo or even, even Michelle Terrian, um, all the assistant coaches on the staff, they all say across the board, he is the most well-prepared guy they've ever encountered as players, as a coach. He prepares for everything. He's he's old school in certain ways. He's very, very progressive in terms of believing in sports science and how hard you can condition these guys um, and really puts a lot of faith. He's good at delegating. And, and for the first time in a while as well, this is a team, it used to be the team goes as the veterans go, as Claude Drew goes, or as Jake Voracek or Sean Couturier even goes. Now it's like, we're talking about Obey Kubel, Scott Lawton got the game winner in overtime the other day. You want to talk about a weird situation in the bubble with it being dead quiet. Kevin Hayes, who people were on the fence about when they signed him that heavy contract, looks like just like an Adonis to everybody now because he's the guy you want on your bench in a dead quiet arena. Like he's the guy who always keeps it going, always keeps him talking, always keeps it light. So the flyers really for a very unique situation kind of have a lot of good pieces in place to succeed in an odd time. Of course, now you also have, you know, Philadelphia fans. I'm born and raised here, so I love them. I'm one of them, but they're like, <laughs> of course, this is the cup when they look the best when everybody wants to put an asterisk next to it. And I'm like, let, let's just let's just be positive for now. And yeah. then maybe like next year, we can also aim for a cup. And then maybe in years following, and then we can all be happy. Like, just let it, let it breathe. Let's just give them a minute. They got to get out of the first round. But <laughs> things look really promising here, which is it's very refreshing. As a born and raised Flyers fan, I know, Carlin, you've got obviously lots of Flyers ties in your family. You know, you got the, the uh, flag in the bag, you know, every yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, is that some orange and black I see back there? there. <laughs> I have my king stuff too, but it's also there. <laughs> Tim and I will say, I love how you say the word orange. Like you say orange? orange. Yeah. Orange. I think orange. Is that weird? I said orange. Orange. <laughs> how do I say it? I don't even know. There's a, a orange. lilt of Philly accent in there. Yeah, I love um, it. I love the Philly accent. You saw I can just, you saw can pipe down. All right. I'm not here for none of this abuse, right. for none of this slander. None and of it. Now offer us some water ice. Water, water ice. Water ice. Water ice. Water ice. Water ice. Well, look, Carlin will always root for the Flyers, but I never will. But it's been a pleasure, Taryn. So I'll go ahead and root <laughs> for you. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank both of you for joining us. Lauren, thank you. Taryn, thank you. Thanks so much, Jeff. We appreciate it. And Carlin, it's yeah. so good to see your face again. I miss you guys. Like I miss, I miss you, you guys both. You're I know. We can, let's all just drive central when this all ends, and we can have yeah. a little reporter bubble and just hang out. Let's bring yeah. it. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> have the draft in Kansas City or somewhere uh, centrally located. Yeah.